Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, today we're going to go over chapter 130, drive axes and differentials. Now we've already kind of had some exposure to differentials in regards to the, um, you guys pulling off the, the dis disassembling the differential to get to the seals that are for um, the actual seals. So for this objective, or for our objective, objectives, we're going to describe the operation of a differential and the gear ratio set types. I'm going to compare the operation of a standard open differential and a limited slip differential. I'm going to describe the components of a differential and the types of bearings used in drive axles. Uh, I'm going to explain how to identify, determine the axle ratio, diagnose, inspect, and disassemble a differential. I'm going to ex explain how to set the drive pinion depth and replace the pinion shaft bearing. Describe the procedure to check backlash and set the preload of pinion gears and side bearings. And I'm going to also discuss the different types of lubricants we use for an actual differential. So the terminology for, for drive axles or different differentials. Terminology. The major parts of a drive axle include the ring and pinion gears, the differential, and the axle shafts. The purpose and the function is to change the direction of engine torque and to allow the drive wheels to rotate at different speeds. And you're gonna see why we actually need them to rotate at different speeds, not necessarily for moving forward, but for actually for turning. So the differential assembly changes the direction of the engine torque and increases the torque of the drive wheels. So as it comes out of the transmission, we have a rotational energy being, uh, spinning the drive shaft. So the power is actually being rotated this direction. Now, when it goes through the differential, it makes a 90 degree turn. Now it starts to rotate each side of the axles or the axle flanges, which are attached to wheels, which then sends power to the ground. The difference between the travel distance of the drive wheel is controlled by the differential. So when we're coming across the turn, because we have wheels that are spaced apart, when we come around a turn, they're both gonna to have to travel different uh, distances. So the inside wheel is gonna to have to travel a lot shorter than the outside wheel. That outside wheel has to actually move faster or rotate faster to actually keep up with that other wheel that's traveling on the inside. So if you have the inner wheel track, you're gonna see that this distance is a lot shorter than this distance, but they have to maintain the same, uh, basically the same path, so they actually the outside one's gonna to have to rotate a lot quicker. That's where the differential comes into play. When the vehicle turns a corner, the inner wheel slows and the outer wheel increases in speed to compensate. This difference in rotational speed causes the pinion gears to walk around the slower, uh, slower side of the gear. So the different parts of a differential. The drive shaft applies torque to the drive pinion gear. The ring gear is attached to a differential case that also contains small beveled fighter gears or pinion gears. A pinion shaft passes through the two pinion gears in the case in mesh with the pinion gears are two side gears that are splined to the inner ends of the axles. So if you guys remember, you have your pinion gear that is attached to the ring gear, and then inside the differential housing, you have two side gears and then the spider gears. Those two side gears are the ones that are actually attached to the axle. So when those rotate, it sends the power through the axle shafts to the wheels. The pinion ring gears during operation. Each slanted ring gear tube has two ends. Its toe is closest to the ring gear center, its heel closest to the outside circumference. The toothed root is the depression lying between two teeth and the crown is the very top of each tooth. While the vehicle accelerates, the drive, act, the drive pinion contacts the ring teeth on its drive or convex side. While decreasing or decelerating, the drive pinion contacts the ring teeth on its coast or concave side. So each one of these splines has a bit of a curve to it. When you're applying the force, it's gonna be grabbing onto one side. When you let go, that force is gonna release and start riding on the opposite side. And it's just to help maintain, it's obviously maintain contact, but when you engage, that's where it actually is gonna grab onto the teeth. But when you think about one with too much slack inside, you're gonna to start to feel that clunkiness or that you're gonna, uh, slight rapping noise heard when you decelerate, when you let go of the throttle, you hear the clunk, or if you're taking off from reverse, you drop it in a drive takeoff, you'll hear the actual ring gear and pinion gear slap against each other. A pair of tapered roller bearings called carrier bearings is used to locate the drive pinion gear and the differential case and ring gear. Another pair of bearing locates the drive pinion gear. So we have two bearings here. Now when you pull this bolt up, you're able to move this flange, this, ring, this pinion gear comes out from the center, so you're gonna actually have to remove the entire carrier to get to this pinion gear. The relationship among the ring gear and the drive pinion as well as the side spider gears. So 
Like I said, in order to get to it, you have to pull out the entire assembly. This assembly here is going to have bearings on the side. It's going to have spacers and shims. That's where you get your to make your adjustments. The ring gear is attached to the housing or the carrier, and inside you're going to have your side gears and spider gears. But in order to remove these, you have to slide the axles out. Or in order to slide the axles out, you have to remove all the stuff on the inside. So it's going to come out as a unit, but the spider gears and side gears are already going to be removed. The drive side is a convex side of the rear gear, except for some front axles that use on four-wheel drive vehicles, and they often use a convex concave side on the drive side. So the concave side is going to be on this portion here. So the the drive side is going to be the more flush or flat surface, and then the one with the actual concave or the the curved area is going to be the coasting side. So what is a high point gear set? A gear set where the pinion meshes with the ring gear below the center line of the ring gear. So this is actually a high point gear set. This style, uh, this style here, where the ring gear meets with the actual. Oh, where'd it go? This is actually called a high point gear set due to the design of the actual gear teeth on them. The gear ratio of the final driver differential is called the axle ratio. To determine the axle ratio, divide the number of teeth of the ring gear or the driven gear by the number of teeth of the drive or pinion gear or driving gear. So let's say we have, uh, let me, I can't really use an example, I don't have any off the top of my head, but in order to do that, what you would have to do is you can actually, if it's all assembled, you can look inside, you mark one of the teeth, and then you start counting them. Count the pinion gear first, and then you count the actual ring gears. So then you divide the ring gear divided by the pinion gear. That's what's going to be your final drive ratio. Ring and pinion gear set types. Hunting gear sets are gear sets with final drive ratios expressible in a fraction that cannot be reduced to any lower term. Non-hunting gear sets are gear sets with the final drive ratios expressible as a whole number. Partially non-hunting gear sets are gear sets with final drive ratios expressible as a reducible fraction, not equaling a whole number. So open differentials. So let's, let's talk a little bit about open differentials and why we use them on pretty much most cars nowadays. Or we always use them for our vehicles and we're still using them now. But um, it's a little more, let's say a little more practical to use an actual open differential rather than a limited slip or a locker. While cornering, it allows the vehicles to turn at much greater speeds in, or, I'm sorry, while cornering allows the vehicles to turn at much greater differences in speed. Torque flow through a standard open differential. Open differentials deliver equal torque to both wheels at all times. When traveling straight on a smooth road surface, the ring gear carrier and drive axles are traveling at the same speed. The ability of the differential pinion gears to slip or to spin on their shafts allows each axle to rotate at different speeds. So you have your spider gear, side gears, you have your pinion gears, or we would call them also spider gears because they look kind of like a spider as they're rotating around. Uh, a close-up view of the side gears and spider gears or pinion gears. Note the ridges on the gear teeth. These ridges are manufactured into the gear teeth to help retain lubrication so that the, there's no metal on metal contact. You want to make sure that everything's nice and lubricated. If you have a leaking differential, uh, say the housing is, uh, the seal around the housing is starting to leak out, definitely want to make sure that you would recommend a, at least a um, reseal. When you do a reseal, you take off the cover, you clean everything up, put on the new, new, a new gasket or new silicone, close it all up and then refill it with uh, the correct amount of fluid and the correct fluid. When we get into uh, the different clutches and types of limited slip differentials, uh, you have to make sure you use the correct fluid because you could damage the clutches and not ca and cause the uh, limited slip differential to not work. Purpose and function. A limited slip differential distributes torque to both wheels equally or unequally, allowing the wheels to turn at the same or different speeds depending on traction. Parts and operation. Preloaded clutches use two mechanisms to accomplish this action. A coiled bell wheel or a leaf spring applies force against the two side gears. A multi-disc clutch pack or cones lie between, behind one or both of the side gears. So let's talk about the cone type first. It uses two tapered cones instead of multi-disc clutch packs. The cones tapered and fits inside the dish receptacle machine into the case. When the cones are forced into their dish receptacles, they come to a stop uh, they come to a stop smoothly, locking the side gears to the case. Viscous cu uh, coupled limited sl slip units. Half of the plates are splined to the case and the other half are alternately splined to each side gear. The plates are housed in a sealed chamber, which is filled with a thick and viscous silicone-based fluid. 
The silicone will allow the normal speed difference between the two shafts, resisting high speed differences associated with wheel spin on one shaft. So when they start to increase in speed, they're going to start to grab and actually cause all the parts or all the clutches to lock up together to allow them to spin at the same speed of the actual carrier. The Eaton Locker Differential. This is where uh, I, I know pretty much about because of uh, off-road. It's real, real good. Uh, a lot in the off-road because they use air lockers and they use electric lockers. And it's actually lock pretty much the side gears and ring gear, uh, pinning gears all together, which then transfers the power without actually losing any traction. When a vehicle spins a rear wheel, both the preloaded multi-disc differential and the Eaton Locker compress their clutch pack line between the side gears and the case. This allows the case to different, directly drive the axles by, by bypassing the effect of the rotating differential pinions. Now, the Eaton Locker differential, they're talking about that one, but they're not even uh, referencing the electronic or the air lockers. If you guys want to know more about that, please let me know and I can actually give you guys an, a little extra lecture if you want about how air lockers and electric lockers work. Torsion differentials use a set of worm side gears and mesh with individual worm wheel pinions that are supported by the differential case. So a two wheel drive vehicle equipped with the open differential, a two wheel drive vehicle equipped with the limited slip differential. So as you can see, they're showing a low friction surface. So let's say it's stuck in, you're stuck in mud or if it's in a, um, a high center area where there's less traction, because there's less traction in this wheel, it's gonna be sending the most power to this wheel, which is kind of counterproductive when you're trying to maintain traction to accelerate or to actually get out of a spot. With a locker or a limited slip differential, it's gonna send power to both wheels. Now it's not gonna send equally across, but it's gonna send more power uh, it's going to send it to both wheels at least to help propel and get you out of uh, the jam whether you're stuck or you're slipping. That's why if you guys go to a drag strip and you guys see uh, guys doing a burnout but only one wheel spin, they call it a one tire fire, it's because they have an open differential and it's not allowing the traction to get split between both wheels. It's sending it to the one with the least amount of traction. Track lock limited slip differential. This type of limited slip differential uses the preload force from a spring and torque generated by the side gears as the two axles rotate at different rates to apply the clutches and limit the amount of difference between the speed of the two axles. So this is the one with the multiple clutch packs. As force gets applied to the side gears, it's gonna to start to engage more into the carrier and it's gonna have it all grab together and cause the power to get sent down. So an Eaton locker differential, now, as you can see, there's a lot more that goes into play with working with Eaton lockers or even a limited slip differential. Um, the upside to this is obviously you get posi traction or posi track. And the downside is there's a lot more parts that can go bad or parts that can break. This Eaton design differential uses a torque limiting disc to prevent the possibility of breaking an axle in an event of high torque demand. When the disc hangs shear, the differential will continue to function as an open but as an open differential rather than a limited slip. So this has more of a fail safe. You guys see these little chains on each side? Now these are meant to break before the axle does. So if you drop the clutch and you gen in, uh, you're in first gear, you dump the clutch when you're taking off trying to drag or someone, these uh, little chains will actually break and allow it to spin. Now you're still gonna be able to drive the vehicle, but you're not gonna have posi track like you did before. So then you have to take it all apart and go ahead and replace all those clutch packs. A torsion differential, this type of differential provides torque both drive wheels even if one tire is on ice. The complex system of gears allows the smooth transfer of torque without the use of clutches. So instead of using the clutches, we have a heck of a, a lot more gears inside. This is to help transfer the power throughout, but it's still allowed to spin when less torque is demanded. When you're actually, say, coming around a turn, it's allowing them to spin at different uh, speeds. But when you want to take off hard or you want to maintain traction, it's going to send power to both wheels. So how does the torsion differential provide limited slip capabilities? It uses a set of worm gears and mesh the individual wheel pinions rather than having clutch plates inside. Drive pinions. The drive pinion gear of the differential is driven by a flange, often called a companion flange. The final drive pinion shaft may be supported by bearings using one of two methods. Two opposed tapered roller bearings with a collapsible or compressible spacer a straddle mounted pinion that uses two opposed taper roller bearings and a third smaller bearing on the machine pilot. Uh, drive pinion de uh, gear depth. The pinion shaft mounting method also determines how deeply the pinion gear meshes into the ring gear. 
The pitting depth adjustment is made by changing the thickness of a shim or a spacer. Side bearings, the differential case is supported by two side bearings pressed into its sides, onto its sides. These are usually tapered roller bearings and are preloaded to ensure case rotation without axial radial movement. So this is the pinion flange, flange or the companion flange. This is a damper way. This is to help cut down vibration as it rotates. There's a lot of mass spinning here. Remember, you have the energy that's coming through the draft shaft that meets up with this pinion flange. There's a lot of mass spinning, and we want to cut down vibration. So make sure if it has a damper, that the damper isn't damaged. And you can see this one's already been balanced. That's why they drill out the hole. So instead of adding weight, they just take away uh, take away weight from the opposite side. A collapsible spacer drive uh, pinion shaft. So when doing a gear replacement or a pinion, or pin, pinion ring gear swap where you're switching for different gears, say you want to go off-roading, say you want to put 411 gears, or if you're doing drag racing where you want to do 383 gears, um, what you're going to do is when you replace the pinion gear itself, you have these two, two bearings facing opposite of each other. This collapsible spacer, make sure you replace this if you're actually doing this swap because the spacer is already crushed. It's a one-time use spacer. If you're putting in new gears, it's going to change the adjustments needed for it. So when you actually go ahead and put it all together, when you're torquing this uh, center nut down and basically bringing everything in nice and tight, you want to make sure that this is going to be replaced because that's what's going to keep the pressure on it. If you put on an old one and then torque this one down to specifications, it's going to have a lot of slack in it because this has already been collapsed. There's no, there's no pressure being push back on it. Side bearings are press, on, pit, uh, press fit onto the differential case. So these bearings themselves, this is the side bearing, this is the race that's gonna be put into the side of the actual carrier where the caps rest on them. But these bearings have to be pressed onto the carrier. So you can see this one doesn't have the race on it. You have to, uh, usually it's a special sleeve or a tool that wraps around, grabs the inner race of the bearing. And when you press it, it presses from the center, basically squeezes and pops it out. So don't try to do this with just a regular press or a, a puller because it's a non-bearing puller because you're going to damage the bearings if you try, try to do so. But usually if you're taking the bearings off, you're going to be replacing them. Some side bearings use threaded adjusters to adjust preload. Um, the threaded adjusters, uh, I don't know if you guys remember that third member that we had that's different from the, the one we were doing with all the brake stuff. That one is actually a, the entire carrier gets put into the housing. But the third member was that one that had the ring and pinion gear all basically mounted to one giant housing that bolts and gets put inside the banjo housing. That one uses a threaded style so you can actually adjust and shift over the ring gear to allow for backlash and for depth. Differential axle bearings, ball bearings slash rear axles. If ball bearings are used, the bearing itself absorbs the radial forces. There's no axle shaft end play or thrust adjustment. Straight roller bearing, the rear axle, the axle surface serves as the inner race. The bearing is lubricated by a hypoid lubricant. There is no axle shaft end play adjustment with this design. Tapered roller bearings are for rear axles. The bearing is pre-lubricated before it is, it is installed and is held by a press fit on the axle shaft. The axle shaft end play is adjustable using either adjustment nut or shims. So here's the axle shaft itself and the inner race is a straight roller bearing is used. So this seal, you're going to pop the seal off and there's going to be a bearing in the back. That bearing is just a straight roller bearing, meaning it's got the cylindrical actual ball bearings. They're not even balls, though, but they're, they're shaped like little barrels and they, they go around the actual inside the housing. So when you slide the axle on, it rides on those bearings and provides the support needed. The straight roller bearings are lubricated by the rear axle fluid and a leak on the rear axle seal can cause the slow to get onto brake components. Uh, Michael, your truck, this is what the, the seal, when it starts to leak, it starts to spit out the fluid, but what's spinning around it is the brake drum. Because it's spinning around the brake drum, it's gonna start throwing fluid all over the place, or it's, it's gonna grab onto the flange and start throwing all over the brake components. Now you've saturated the brake, the brake shoes. Now you have to do a breakdown of why you do actually an axle reseal. Differential identification. Before any service work is performed on a differential assembly, the exact axle specification must be determined. Differential assembly identification includes visual identification, axle assembly number, the limited slip identification tag if it has limited slip, and the differential cover shape. <clears throat> the pinion gear thrust washers can be destroyed by spinning one wheel for an extended period of time. Um, <clears throat> the part that they're talking about here, 
let's go into this play scenario real quick. When you get a flat tire, let's say you have a rear wheel drive vehicle, you get a flat tire, but you don't have the correct size tire or the correct size wheel, and it's a lot smaller. Let's say you put a lift on your truck and you put 35s, but all you have is that original 31 inch spare tire. Now, when you do a, when you get a flat tire and you have to swap out that wheel and you swap it out in the back, you have one wheel spinning a hell of a lot faster than the other wheel. Because it's spinning a lot faster than the other wheel, it's going to cause the premature wear of these thrust washers. That's why I say it can destroy your differential if you put the wrong size spare tire on a vehicle that has either larger tires or smaller tires. So make sure when you do that, what you want to do is if your the spare tire is smaller than the other wheel on your drive axle, take that wheel, put it on the opposite end and put the bigger wheel back on the, that one side. So if you uh, have a rear wheel drive truck, you have 35s, take the front wheel off, put that one on the back, put the spare on the front because you don't want to damage your differential by having one side spin faster than the other side. Determine the actual ratio of a differential. Hoist the vehicle safely, mark the rear tires with masking tape at 12 o'clock position, mark the drive shaft with masking tape, have an assistant hold one drive tire to keep from moving and slowly rotate the wheel drive tire exactly 10 times while the assistant counts the drive shaft revolutions. Multiply the drive shaft revolutions by two, except for a limited slip differential, and then move the decimal point one place to the left. Um, I'm not gonna worry about doing that. I would actually rather do a, a quick little lecture with you guys to show you how to figure out the ratio uh, by the gears themselves, not just by spinning the tire because it, it can make a big difference and throw off your measurements when you're doing it that way. Rear end noise diagnosis. Typical noise at its source include grinding or growling noise while turning, usually causes defective axle bearing, wine noise during cruise, drive pinion bearings are most likely the cause of this type of noise. Differential inspection. Carefully inspect the differential for obvious damage or wear. Check the backlash. Also use dial indicator to check ring, ring gear runout. Ring gear runout meaning the actual, the, um, the warp, the warpage on the actual ring gear. So if the ring gear is nice and straight, but if it has, if it's a, there's a bend in it or something that, um, something's wrong with it, it'll actually cause that wobble and that wobble will actually start to destroy bearings. So definitely don't want a lot of run out on it. Or you can say straightness. We'll say straightness rather than run out. This differential has obviously been leaking. If the differential lubricant is low, wear may have occurred that would require further inspection. So when you come across this scenario, what you want to do is you want to pull the cover, take a look at all the gears. Make sure that the gears don't have excessive wear on the actual mating surfaces where the gears ride on. If you have excessive wear, then you might want to recommend replacement of the ring and gear, uh, or even just the entire axle itself. Or you may have to do adjustments. Backlash is determined by mounting a dial indicator in differential housing and placing the button of the gauge against the tooth of the ring. Moving the ring gear back and forth while indicate, uh, while will indicate on the dial indicator the amount of backlash. So you're going to have play between the ring gear and the, the pinion gear. Here's the pinion gear, here's the ring gear. That play, the difference in between when the rear gear makes contact with one side and the other side is your backlash. If you have too much backlash, your ring, your pinion depth is too far out because you're coming up on the smaller side of the cone. If you have not enough ring gear, if it's just made it all the time, you're gonna have premature wear because it's rubbing too hard. You wanna have just a little bit and usually it will give you a um, specification of how much pinion depth you should actually have due to the backlash. Backlash is the difference between the drive pinion and the ring gear teeth. So this is showing 0.005 to 0.008. That's the gap that they're talking about, moving back and forth. That small little bit that when you rotate the ring gear before it makes contact with the pinion gear on the other side. Ring gear runout should be less than 0.002 inch or 0.05 millimeters as measured by the dial indicator. So as you rotate the ring gear, you're gonna wash the gauge. When you wash the gauge, you can see how, basically how bent the ring gear is. Now it's a solid, it's a real solid piece of steel, but you can still get warpage in that actual ring gear. Tooth contact pattern test. A tooth contact pattern test is an excellent method for checking proper drive pinion depth as well as proper backlash between the drive pinion and ring gear. Any faults in these areas will be reflected in the pattern. So what you actually do is you take a small amount of paint, you go ahead and paint up a few of the teeth. You don't do them all, just do a few of them. And as you rotate, 
when you rotate it, it's going to start to leave marks. It's going to take away some of the paint on the actual section that you did. And it's going to show you where they're coming in contact with each other. But make sure you spin it in the correct direction. If you spin it in the opposite direction, it's not going to give you a proper, uh, basically a proper reading of how they're actually made. The, I'm pretty sure the tooth contact pattern, this, uh, since you guys can't see it all that well, I want you guys to look at this in your books and you know do a little bit of research on this. It's going to show you where you have too high of a pinny gear, too low of a pinny gear, not enough backlash, too much backlash. So definitely just read up on this. This is, you know, it's not going to be too much on the test, but it will definitely benefit you guys in the long run. Differential disassembly. I'm not really going to, we've already kind of gone over how to uh, disassemble it, you know, we're going to walk you through the steps, um, but these are all going to be also, like I said, in your book, it's just to help you guys save time, you guys aren't hearing me, you know, just ramble on about stuff we've pretty much already done. Um, let's see, checking and correcting backlash. It's, they're all pretty much the same. Um, the way you would actually adjust backlash, let's see, a dial indicator is used to measure it. The backlash should be checked to three or four points around the ring gear. Backlash normally between 0 .005 and 0 .008. Uh, backlash is corrected by moving the ring gear either closer or farther away from the drive pinion gear, transferring shim from one side of the axle housing to the other, turning threaded adjusters located at the differential housing boards. So in order to correct backlash, there's going to be shims right here, okay? The shims here push the, pin, uh, the ring gear closer to the pinion in this direction or further away from the pinion in this direction. If this, the ring gear was on the other side, it would be closer to the ring gear, further from the ring gear. So whichever way the teeth are pointing, if you go inward, that's tighter, outward, it's more, uh, more loose. The spreader tool, uh, so being installed, the housing is spread a specific amount and differential then installed into the housing. So you can actually open the housing up a little bit. You place the house, um, the axle, the differential housing in, and then bolt it down and then release it. These are the adjusters that I was telling you guys about earlier. This is actually to where, where it sits inside. There's two adjusters on each end. And when you pull the, the four bolts off with the two caps on each end, when you loosen one side, it's going to bring it in this way, and when you tighten the other side, it's going to push against that way. So whatever you do on this side, you got to do on the opposite side, the opposite. So it'll actually shift it left and right to give you the, pro the proper backlash or proper depth of the ring gear. A long handled adjuster tool is needed to turn the outside bearing adjuster on its truck. So the show you this pops in and actually will rotate the bearing, uh, side bearing adjuster. So that one goes in and will help shift it over. So this tool locks into here, which then allows you to, to shift it over without disassembling the entire carrier. Setting side bearing preload. To accomplish the proper preload, thicker shims that were used to set proper backlash are placed between the housing and the differential to provide the proper preload and side bearing. After setting the preload, double check that the backlash is within specification. So they're actually installing the shims themselves and popping them in, and it's doing the same thing. It's setting them left, setting them right, a spool used on the rear end, drag racing only. So, um, let's go to talk about spools or mini spools. These have no side gears. I'm sorry, have no side gears. They have no uh, spider gears. It takes away the entire differential, so you have full rotation of both wheels at all times. Now, what would be the downside to having this? Obviously, it's coming around turns, so this would be pretty much a track-only vehicle because it's very uncomfortable to drive. If you've ever driven a car with a locker in the rear or with limited slip that actually functions, both wheels are going to be spinning at the same speed, so you're going to get a chirping and hopping as you're coming around the turn, and pretty much U-turns are non-existent. Now, the other downside is if you don't build up the rest of the rear end, you're definitely going to snap an axle, or you may even actually damage and snap a U-joint in your dry shaft. You have so much torque being transferred through and out the wheels, something is bound to give. Remember, you're, the, the, you're only as strong as your weakest point. Now, if you use stock axles and you dump the clutch with a spool inside, you're definitely going to snap an axle. So then you want to get reinforced axles with larger splines or more splines, and it's going to help strengthen the actual uh, system overall. Reassembly of the differential. 
Uh, after the backlash has been checked, if they, uh, to be within factory specifications, the axle shafts can be installed, install the C-clips, install the differential cover, and then fill with the correct lubricant. Install the axle shafts, be careful not to damage the seal, so when you slide the axles in, don't just let it ride, you want to kind of support it as you slide in, and then mate it up with the side gears inside the differential housing, and then go ahead and put the C-clip in. Differential lubricant. Because all differentials use high point gear sets, a special lubricant is necessary because the gears both roll and slide between their mesh teeth. So instead of just making contact like this, they're actually sliding across. And when they slide across, they need a different type of lubricant rather than just making contact with each other. Most differentials require ADW90, 7590, ADW solid, or Limited slip differentials do only abbreviated LSD, usually you use a friction modifier additive. So it's to help promote friction between the clutches themselves. A, content, a container of GL5 ADW90 gear oil. Now this stuff smells really, really bad. I would prefer the smell of automatic transmission fluid over gear oil, especially old gear oil. If you guys have ever gotten it on you, you're gonna smell it the rest of the day. It's kind of like a dead body. What is the purpose of a limited slip additive? That's correct. To modify characteristics of lubricant and prevent chattering on turns. The beginning automotive student did not realize that the axle housing cover could fit the other they hit the wrong way. The only problem was that the ring gear scraped against the cover. So this cover is pretty much it can be mounted in either up or down. But if you notice on each one of these covers, it has little indentations and grooves to allow for ring gear clearance. And he is a pin attention, went ahead and put it on, and it actually went ahead and uh, grind it across the, the cover itself. Now as long as there wasn't really any damage done to the green gear, then you could just flip it back over, but obviously you have to reseal and refill it, waste the oil. So, if you guys have any questions, like I said, I do want to go over how ele uh, electronic and air lockers work with, uh, with you guys. Uh, that'll be obviously a separate separate lecture. There isn't going to be an extra chapter on it, but uh, if and I also want to kind of do a little walkthrough. Maybe I'll do another video where I disassemble the entire axle for you guys. Um, but I just wanted to get the lecture out of the way. So like I said, if you have any questions, please let me know. And uh, we'll get back to you guys as soon as you can. But please, let's stay on top of checking in our Survey Monkey every single day. Just do two questions. I send you guys the questions all the time. It only takes a few minutes. And it just makes sure, it makes sure that you guys get your attendance. I don't want you guys to fail because you guys forgot to do the Survey Monkey. You know, I try to remind you guys all the time. So let's keep on top of it, you guys. You guys are doing great. I know it's still a little unorthodox. It's a lot harder for me to do my lectures with no one in here than it is with you guys actually in here. So let's have a good one, you guys, and I'll talk to you guys later.